in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. Uh, uh, of course, I agree with some of my professors and some that I've uh, read that this is surely should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit of God. And so the book of Acts this morning, chapter 1, I want to talk to you this morning about questions to learning God's will. Questions to learning God's will. Uh, it reminded me of a story, uh, John Piper came, he was at a Presbyterian church in Anderson, South Carolina, and I went over there to hear him, and writes a lot of great books, I, I love John Piper, and he was sharing a story about God's will. Uh, you know, for him, uh, he spoke a lot about missions, world missions. He would go around to youth groups, he would go around to conferences and speak about world missions, trying to get more people overseas and on the mission field. Uh, it came a point that a young boy decided he would go on a mission trip or uh, commit his life later, possibly, to long-term missions. And so as they were at the airport, the son, the father, and John Piper are right there. Uh, the son gets on the plane, and after the son is nowhere to be seen, the father turns around and looks at John Piper, and he says, if anything happens to my son, I will kill you. Dear friends, missions and receiving Christ, if you haven't understood it already, uh, your life was not a pink Cadillac and roses in hand, but for just a short time when you came to Christ. Jesus, in fact, yes, he gives us joy and peace, but God also wants commitment in our lives. What I have come to realize is that God is not going to beg anybody to come to church. He's not going to beg us. Now God can bring some things in our life to help us understand, to realize. God's not going to beg you to go on the mission field. God's not going to beg you to be a pastor. Now God can create circumstances to get your attention. He did that plenty of times in my life. And my, my wife Shannon would probably need some WD-40 because she's probably shaking her head over and over and over. And so I know that God has got this hard-headed boy's attention time and time again. John Piper continued to tell people about world missions as those others like John MacArthur and uh, many, many of pastors continue to preach that Christ is not just in the foundation or in the building of a church here, but in fact, He is on the outside. He is working through the community. He is working with different people. As you talk about Samaria. Uh, that was a half-breeded community. Half of them maybe might have been half Jew. Uh, they might have been half another race. And they were despised by some of the Jewish people. But God came down, did He not, to a well to a woman in Samaria, and told her the good news of the gospel. Let me just let you know that God does not discriminate when sharing the gospel. It is available to all. The well-educated, the ones that only finished sixth grade, the Lord is about the gospel. For every race, for every black person, for every white person, for every nation, tribe, and tongue, God's gospel is available for all. Amen. So when we look at what's going on here in the scripture, God is trying to, or is rather, forming relationships and also changing fellowship. Uh, we do see that when we look at Matthew 16, before we get to the scripture, Jesus predicted his crucifixion. From that time, it says, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned around and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on things above, on God, but on things of man. What was Jesus saying there? My kingdom is eternal. 
If I stay down here as a king with a throne and a scepter, guess what? It's just temporary. And my kingdom is way much more important. In fact, Jesus predicted his resurrection. In Matthew 17, 22 to 23, says, When they came together in Galilee, he said to him, my, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Where are you going, Jesus? Have you ever been there in your life? Where are you going, Jesus? I feel alone. Are you going to abandon me, Jesus? You started all these good things. I've left my career. I've left my job. Where are you going, Jesus? I need to know. Dear friends, that brings us to the first question. Where is Jesus going? Where is Jesus going? Look at verses 9 through 11 in Acts this morning. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a, cl a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You see, they heard these things that were spoken and they continued to watch. I would be there. I would be one that was watching. I would want to see, okay, Jesus is going, and he's going up. That's why a lot of our perception is that heaven is up, because we see Jesus ascending into heaven. Now, do I know where the location of heaven is? You don't either. But I do know there is a heaven. It is a real place. Although I have not seen Jesus face to face, what he's done in my life is evidence that he is a savior that transforms lives. Not only that, heaven is real. Wherever the location is there, I don't care about the address. I know that when I die, my Google Maps is going to get me there. You made the wrong turn. Turn around, idiot. No. My friends, Jesus set the ways perfectly for all of us. There's no U-turn. It's all on the straight and narrow with him. But they watched as he was taking up to the cloud. Uh, Jesus fulfilled everything he was supposed to do, did it in the manner in which he wanted to do, and he was faithful in bringing it to close. And they looked steadfast. Their eyes were gazed upon them. That he was the center of their attention. And they, they just focused and wondering. You have to wonder. I know you've had people die in your family. You've had grandparents maybe die. And you wonder, man, when are they going to die? Oh, man, it's really happening. Oh, they're suffering. And then when they actually die, it hits you. Dear, dear friends, the disciples were filled with with grief. Yes, they serve a resurrected Savior, but at the same point, they didn't understand everything that was going on. Jesus was never abandoning them. Dear friends, Jesus is omnipresent. Although he ascended up into heaven, Jesus is always everywhere present. He's an ever present help, it says in Psalms 46, in times of trouble. So he was not abandoning them. In fact, he was going away so something better could happen to them. And so we do see they looked steadfastly as he went 